Pimping ain't easy, but somebody's got to do it. It's your boy Crypto Blood. What's going on, people? Welcome to another episode of My Two Satoshis. And I want to give a shout out to High on High. He wanted me to play some Pimpology. Do or Die or Do or Die Pimpology. It's the song name. The group is Do or Die. So there you have it, man. Appreciate the song request. This is an old one. Throwback. I definitely remember this one. But today, people, it is Saturday. We're going to do a um, off-the-chain live stream later today. I'm thinking around 4 or 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll give you guys about an hour or so heads up on that. So uh, today we're going to talk about how to track stolen Bitcoin. So many of you probably, probably already know I'm a computer geek type of dude always been into computers started programming when i was 13. i used to do uh create these some of the old school cats would know this you know remember aol and aim chat even before aim had its own individual or or in a separate program you know we had aim within aol but i used to program these punters uh in visual basic and these punters would send a string of characters to the chat window. And, and depending on who you're pointing that punter to, it would kick them off a line. So that's how I started my journey, actually, in, in computers and coding and stuff. Um, but I follow and subscribe to a, a channel called um, Computer File. And they always have interesting... Um, subjects on computer science different you know just a broad range of topics right um, I also follow number file as well but anyway uh, every once in a while they'll have stuff on and it's becoming more and more common that they have things on blockchain or Bitcoin and so you, you'll get an in take on blockchain and Bitcoin from a more computer science perspective so I always like um, watching those videos and in particular getting a different view about Bitcoin is always interesting so I do have something for you guys to watch today regarding tracking stolen Bitcoins and thought it may be interesting to some of you guys who may be less technical and you know it's always good to learn more things as we get older is never stop learning so uh, before we do that, though, let's go ahead and look at the market cap. We're currently at 342 billion. Bitcoin's dominance is at 44.3 percent, it looks like, and a green day overall. Top hundred tokens are all pretty much green, with a, with the exception of a couple or a few, I should say, and looking good. So as far as the chart goes, we're back above the 8600. So, I, you know, and I didn't even look at my algo to see. Um, hold on, let me. I'm gonna pause this and look at my algorithm. Yeah, my my algo is still showing um, a sell signal. However, I'm not even done. I don't know why I'm even telling you guys what the algo is doing yet, because I haven't even implemented two of the three um, signals. I'm currently just running on one of the signals for this trading strategy with this algo but uh, I mean this by itself will work I back tested just having one of the three signals running with this strategy but I still need to uh, implement the other two to bring up the profit factor uh, much higher so just kind of want to start giving you guys a little sneak peek of what's going on with the with the algo so personally from from me just looking at the charts I would say that we're back to being a bullish stance once again um, especially after seeing us bounce off of this we broke above this candle here really shot us above the resistance area of 8600 again 8640 something 
and then we came back down and, and tested that again and then we bounced off of that once again so that's a good sign there so hopefully we can go back t towards um, 9200 and test this area again we got a score point I'm just gonna draw a little score point here we need to score a point here if we can do that we will uh you know we'll head we'll head higher we'll head higher more so something like this like that so hopefully we can do that on this next run up so that's it for that again today we're going to look at a video I think you guys would like it especially if you're non-technical this may shed some light uh, into how how you would go about tracking stolen bitcoin and how and it kind of goes with the whole theme for this week has been you know anonymity it you know how how anonymous is bitcoin from a you know just as a general as of today type of uh standpoint and you know we talked about privacy coins earlier this week as well but uh we'll take a look at this video and uh I'll pin a comment below this video that will have a link to the video we're getting ready to watch. So enjoy, people. I'll talk to you later. Stuff. Um, it's not just things like online drug dealing. It's things like um, you know viruses which will encrypt your hard disk and hold you up to ransom from the original crypto locker through things like WannaCry. And in the old days, kidnapping just didn't work because you couldn't get the money away. And the existence of cryptocurrencies changes that in, in ways that may have wider ramifications. What we've been looking at um, is how you go about tracking stolen bitcoins. Suppose you're foolish enough to let people know that you've got $10 million worth of bitcoins and somebody comes into your house and sticks a gun up your nostril and gets you to transfer them to him. How can you go about tracing the stolen loot? Well, people have known since the beginning of Bitcoin that you can in fact trace stuff because the blockchain is entirely public and all the transactions are there for everybody to see. But how do you go about doing this in practice? People like Malta Moser and Reiner Burma came up with a couple of approaches. The first approach they said is poison tainting. And poison tainting means that if you put a bad Bitcoin um, into a transaction or address, then it poisons everything that's there. So if you open a new wallet and you put in three stolen Bitcoins and then seven freshly mined Bitcoins, then when you go and spend that UTXO, it's 10 stolen Bitcoins. The problem with this is that over a few thousands or tens of thousands of blocks, it completely poisons the entire blockchain, or at least the active blockchain that people are using for trading. So the second method that they come up with was what they call haircut tainting. And here, if you put three stolen Bitcoins into a new wallet and then seven freshly mined ones, then you end up spending 10 Bitcoins, each of which is 30% tainted, and you just write the software to track all this. Now, the problem with haircut tainting is that within a few thousand blocks, you end up with all the active Bitcoins in the blockchain being tainted just a little bit under 10%, because something over 6% of all Bitcoins have been stolen at least once. So what can we do about this? Well, the breakthrough came when I was talking with David Fox, who was one of our law lecturers and is now a law prof at, at Edinburgh. And he pointed me to what lawyers know as Clayton's case. And this was a judgment of the High Court in London in 1816 um, after a bank went bankrupt during the Napoleonic War and they had to sort out who owned what uh, among the rubble. And the master of the rolls, one of the senior judges in England at the time, ruled that you had to do first in, first out, right? The first money that went into an account is used to satisfy the first checks that are drawn on it. And so this gives us a sound legal basis for trying to do some computer science because first in, first out, or FIFO is something that programmers and communications engineers understand very, very well. So we went and wrote some software which does a FIFO tent of the blockchain. And so whenever coins are stolen and put in a transaction, perhaps joined with other coins, the coins that went in first are the coins that go out. The first Satoshi in is the first Satoshi out and so on. And when we run this over the blockchain, we find that a fascinating thing happens, that the taint remains concentrated rather than being spread out. 
So for example, if you look at a theft of about a thousand bitcoins in 2014 and trace it forward to 2016, then if you use poison tenting or haircut tenting, then it affects about one and a half million addresses, which is a lot. However, um, if you use FIFO tenting, then only 11,000 addresses are affected. So what's happening here um, is that bad bitcoins tend to keep on circulating in bad neighborhoods of the internet. And we find that whereas, you know, with haircut tenting, most of the bitcoins out there are tainted one way or another, if you use FIFO tenting, then the majority of bitcoins aren't tainted at all. The taint is concentrated um, among oh gosh, about 20% or so of the Bitcoin stock. All of a sudden, we've got a practical way to trace stolen Bitcoins, both over the short term, if somebody came and did an armed robbery at your house yesterday, and over the medium term, if a Bitcoin exchange goes bust and it turns out that somebody inside it has been stealing Bitcoins for a year or so. So it, it, it's fit for both purposes. And this has got all sorts of impl interesting implications um, now that the regulators have started insisting that Bitcoin exchanges be regulated. Now, the, the US Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is part of the US Treasury, started um, requiring Bitcoin exchanges to be regulated in 2013. They busted BTCE, which was a big criminal-operated Bitcoin exchange in Greece, and they went and busted a few places in America as well. And so now the message has got across, and even in you know, relatively remote places like the Philippines, they've now got round to passing laws saying that all Bitcoin exchanges have got to register as foreign exchange dealers. And that means that when you change Bitcoins, whether into dollars or euros or pounds or even into pesos, um, you've got to produce your passport and a couple of utility bills so that there's a record of who you are. The European Union, for its part, has decided when they uh, amend the fourth anti-money laundering directive that they're going to require companies who provide hosted Bitcoin wallet services to also um, fall under the regulation. And this means that if you get your Bitcoin wallet run online by a service company, as the great majority of Bitcoin users do, then you'll have to provide your passport and your gas bills just as if you were opening an account at HSBC. There's an interesting top level view of this, which is that very often when a new disruptive technology comes along, um, people build systems and they completely ignore the existing laws for a while and they try and build something better. And if they do build something better, then it gets uh, you know, blessed with regulation and absorbed into the system. Uber comes along and it says, we're not a taxi company, we're a service company, we're a platform. And um, so they start providing cheap taxi rides in London and then people notice that um, some of the cars are unsafe, that the drivers are working 16 hours a day, that they're getting less than minimum wage, that they're not getting criminal records background checks, that sometimes they rape customers and the crimes aren't reported. And eventually the mayor of London says, listen, pal, you are a taxi company and we're pulling your license. See you in court. And the moral is that very often when you get a new and disruptive phenomenon coming along, um, you can sort it out perfectly well by applying existing law to it once you can figure out an intelligent way to do that. And so what we've done um, is produce software which enables you to track stolen bitcoins effectively. And we're going to be making this publicly available so that if your bitcoin gets stolen, you can apply it to the, dot, the blockchain and you can find where your property's gone. And we're also going to be publishing a taint chain, which will be a public list of coins that have been publicly reported to be stolen. And we hope that that will be taken over by the authorities, perhaps by Europol or somebody like that, uh, and will then have to be um, taken into account uh, by Bitcoin exchanges when they ponder whether to give value for a piece of cryptocurrency that somebody's offered them. If I'm holding some Bitcoin and as far as I know legitimately, why do I want to go and find out if they might actually be stolen? Well, this, 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 is, a, uh, this is a perpetual problem um, with anti-money laundering um, measures in that nobody actually wants to know the truth, right? Citibank what doesn't want to know that they've got John Gotti as a customer and they would push back very, very hard against laws which said that Citibank CEO had to go to jail if it turned out that a mafia boss was a customer. So instead they lobby for laws which say that uh, so long as Citibank has got a passport and two gas bills off every customer, they don't have to go to jail. And so Mr. Gotti is good at finding passports and gas bills and 
<laughs> City Bank doesn't have to go to jail and everybody's happy. And so we've got ourselves at a, a, an equilibrium in the anti-money laundering world of traditional money that doesn't really quite work. However, once you move into the world of cryptocurrencies, the fact that cryptocurrencies are completely uh, traceable changes the game entirely. It, you know, once you have got public information of what money went where and when, it suddenly becomes impossible to, for banks to turn around and say, now hang on a minute, we didn't know.